Hi Fox Render Farm. Hi, I'm Mike Seymour. I'm a researcher and uh, I work with virtual humans and uh, digital people and I'm here at uh, SIGGRAPH in Brisbane. So I research uh, human computer interfaces or HCI which is the idea of how we deal with a computer. Now if you think about it most computers are just getting input from a mouse or from a keyboard but what if we could talk to our computers? What if the computers could respond to us emotionally? So the work that I do with digital humans or virtual humans is putting a face on technology. We're uh, putting a face there so that we can interact with that because after all we work really well with faces, we respond to faces, we uh, travel great distances to see someone face to face and so we think it'd be really interesting if we could uh, take that idea of having a face and put it on a computer and allow us to work with that in a much more natural and kind of, dare I say, human way. So one of the most interesting things that's happened just in the last couple of years has been this amazing nexus of technology and uh, approaches. So we've got this combination of things that are really blowing the doors of what's possible because we can start to produce very photorealistic digital humans. In other words, people that really look like us. Now this is super important because if we produce something that looks not very good, we actually have a negative reaction to it. It's not like audio, whether you have sort of good quality and then better quality and then great quality. With people, we have either cartoons or we need very, very high quality. But if we have something that's not so good, people actually reject it out of hand. So we call this like a non-linear response. In other words, as it gets better in quality, your reaction varies up and down a lot. So, only recently we've been able to produce these incredibly realistic faces and most importantly for HCI, those faces can run in real time. So they can smile at you in real time, talk to you in real time, nod and gesture, which is very, very different from a video or something you might see in a feature film where they might have hours and hours to produce a clip. We need to produce these things in sometimes as short as about 9 to 12 milliseconds. So one of the big challenges we have is actually we've done a lot of really great work on uh, faces and on being able to produce digital humans and that work's not done but it's certainly advanced tremendously in the last sort of three or four years. We're now having to grapple with how do we solve some of the issues over voices. If I'm actually uh, talking to someone in China and I'm in Sydney and uh, like my colleague uh, is from China, of course speaks the language but I don't. If we're on a conference call and somebody at the other end doesn't speak uh, Chinese, uh, like I don't speak Chinese, we have this problem that I have to solve the language. Now, if I've got an avatar, something that I'm puppeting, then I would be able to speak in English and have a version of me speak in Mandarin and be able to understand across barriers. That's good and that's great. But what if I'm not puppeteering it? What if I actually want the computer to talk to me? I now need to make a synthetic voice. And the challenge right now is to see if we can do what we've done for faces to audio to voices. It's kind of a thing you may not expect, but of course what we want is the computer to speak in a really natural way, to have the right cadence, the right kind of tone, the right kind of attitude. And so getting that natural sounding audio, it's not that it's harder than it is to do the vision, but we're actually a lot less tolerant of problems with audio. If you're watching a movie and the vision isn't quite right but you can hear everything, you'll be really, really happy. But if you're in a situation that the vision looked great but you couldn't hear what the actors were saying, you'd switch the channel or, or do something else. So what we're trying to do now is get the audio to be impeccably good so that it can go along with what we've been doing in vision. The astounding thing is that we actually have now more compute power than we need to do some of the functions we've got to do with the computer. We can afford to spend some of that compute power on producing these amazingly interactive user interfaces. That's part one and that's obviously been influenced enormously by GPUs and just uh, and, uh, much faster graphics. And on top of that, we've had a new approach to how to use the graphics, which is AI or deep learning. So now we have the second part of the jigsaw puzzle, which allows us to do incredibly clever things by letting the machine learn my face and then synthesize a 
plausible version of my face, again, in real time because of that GPU. And then the third part of that jigsaw puzzle is that we're able to do that now increasingly with 5G. Now, 5G is obviously very new, but what it offers us is not just bandwidth, which imagine it would be uh, able to sort of transform more, more data. That's part of it, but one of the real secrets for 5G is low latency. So in fact, we can have interactivity. So things come to life when they're realistic, uh, they're rendered quickly, that they are realistic because we've used actual faces to construct them, and then we have this very low latency so that we can interact. All of that is just going to change how we do communication, education, and even in uh, areas you might not imagine, such as health. We are really keen to work with people all over the world, uh, and it's the mantra of our lab that uh, the research that we do, we actually don't own the IP, so we give away all the data. So we work with companies around the world so that we can give back to the community. Our interest is seeing that this uh, moves forward. And one of the great things about rendering on the cloud and the idea of being able to have a really good infrastructure that's on a global basis is that with high-speed communications and with 5G, we're increasingly seeing this being something that we can adopt into things that general people can use. So at the moment we've got a history where like I might be using a render farm if I'm a really big company, but what we're seeing now is this move to the importance of being able to do things that can be democratised. And I think we're going to see this vast explosion where we want to have quite a lot of power on our uh, personal device, but actually tapping into a, a broader deep learning AI kind of environment to provide this great interactivity. And as that happens with low latency and the kind of infrastructure we're seeing, the ability to uh, scale up is just going to produce sensational results. So a lot of submissions to Real Time Live this year, but Real Time Live is a little different from other things because you need to actually mount a performance, as it were. So it's a bit like volunteering for a stage show. Uh, if I'm coming here to do a talk, well, I bring my PowerPoint on my laptop. But if I'm coming here to do real-time live, uh, like the uh, Matt AI project or the uh, number of the other projects that are being, being seen, you actually have to bring a whole lot of computers, a whole lot of gear, and actually mount uh, a live presentation. You have nine minutes to uh, sort of wow the audience. And of course, it's very unforgiving because in nine minutes you can't afford to switch the computer off and start again. So we've been really impressed with the variety of projects and the variety of applications that they're addressing. So we have teams that are addressing making digital characters talk, which is one of my favorites, I love that one. But we've also got ones where people are looking at how to use uh, VR and real-time graphics for science research, for communication. Uh, as well as just artistic pieces that are very much just producing a really amazing show in their own right. I was in the visual effects industry for many years and uh, got nominated for Emmys and, and AFIs and that was all great. I enjoyed that and it was terrific work. What I decided a little while ago, having done quite a lot of uh, research and teaching and increasingly doing consulting work to companies around the world, we still do. I thought it'd be really interesting to up that research component and get more involved with hardcore research. I'm still com consulting, I do work for a major Hollywood studios um, and I enjoy that work tremendously. But what I'm interested in is can we, in addition to that work in the entertainment industry, take that tech and apply it to these other areas? So for example, my uh, research area at the moment is seeing if we can't take some of this digital human technology and use it for stroke victims. So people that have had stroke have trouble forming short-term memories. They're very good with long-term memories, but they literally find everything that's going on around them today a little unfamiliar and disconcerting. There's an extraordinary high level of stroke in the world. A lot of people have strokes, and quite a high percentage are actually under the age of 65 and are wanting to still continue to contribute and, and uh, work because they're of that younger age. Now, of course, we want everybody to benefit from this, but particularly those people that are still trying to work in the world, if you have problems with short-term memory, all technology starts to become a challenge. And we expect someone to use a computer just to use a phone these days. Well, if we could put a familiar face on the technology, a face from their past, a face that is, they don't think it's a real person, but they are familiar, reassuring, 
then this new thing, this new technology, whatever it is, suddenly no longer seems quite so harsh, so unfamiliar, so uh, disconcerting. And we think that's a really good way of being able to help with rehabilitation. And so this is just one of the areas that we're looking at, taking this terrific tech from the entertainment industry, which I love to death, but just seeing if we can't help people that are less fortunate that have been through uh, you know, really hard circumstances. So there's been really great work done in uh, technology around the world. Obviously some of the big film companies uh, like Weta Digital and ILM have been doing terrific work. The research that I've been doing, we've managed to partner with companies around the world. So when we were doing a digital version of me, for example, uh, we were partnering with Epic Games, but also with uh, Tencent, which was terrific, uh, and companies in Serbia uh, and in England. And so it's an international kind of collective. And one of the things that really inspires me is how open these companies are of working together and uh, sharing what's going on, because there's a lot more to be gained by expanding what we can do than uh, people worrying about individual bits. So the community that's doing this work has been really generous and really open with their work. So Gemini Man is one of the most uh, startling and uh, just groundbreaking pieces of production that I've certainly seen. I was really impressed by uh, a number of things. Firstly, they were doing work at Weta Digital where really we sort of knew the character very well at both ages. We know Will Smith as he is today, but we knew Will Smith earlier in his career. We know from our own research that the more familiar you are with a face, the harsher you are. So if you had a younger version of someone you didn't know, it may look great to your eye, but their brother or sister would be very upset by it. They wouldn't feel uh, right to them. So what we're trying to see is if companies like Weta can't produce very familiar faces in a way that we find acceptable, reassuring, entertaining, and I think they've really done that with Gemini Man. The second thing that really impressed me is that in that film, while it's an action film, there are a lot of very sort of slower emotional scenes where there's really nowhere to hide. The young Will Smith is on screen and the camera isn't flying around. Um, sure, there are bike chases, but there are other scenes where he's really acting. And to get that so that the audience can buy into that performance, I think is terrific. I really applaud the work that the team over at Weta Digital have done. It's, it's absolutely world-breaking. I think one of the things that I've been uh, really happy about is to how internationally uh, the community has come together. There are teams now that have got like sort of pockets of excellence. Um, there's a couple of teams in China that are just spectacularly good. Um, and obviously what we've seen with the work in China, and I've certainly lectured up in China and uh, visited many times, is we've got a real uh, depth of both technical expertise and creativity. So um, it's really great to see the infrastructure being built up, things like the render farms and stuff, so that they can provide that technical support that will match the creativity because I think that's been really good. Now there's a team in, uh, two teams in China I can think of, there's a team in Europe, a team in New Zealand, a team in Serbia, uh, and in, in London and of course America. And so what's great is to see that this is a very balanced international effort. Uh, and I love the fact that here at SIGGRAPH Asia, we've got all of these sort of teams coming and presenting their work and sharing things because, as I said earlier, there's so much to be gained by people cooperating and working collaboratively together. And from all my years in the film industry, you know, it's a thousand people that do the visual effects on a film. And so you need this great collaboration of artists, this great infrastructure from companies supporting that. And then of course you need to have people willing to be open and share their ideas as they're doing here at SIGGRAPH Asia. So it's really great.